Okay, so you should, you should know, just, just to make clear, from a European point of view, and from a Hungarian point of view, there is two countries in the region of the southern part of the Mediterranean. It's Israel and Egypt. If any of them became unstable, the migration flows from that direction will come to Europe immediately. So we have to stabilize these countries and these regions. Stability is the interest of the Europeans. When will you get a peace facility? When will you get a peace facility? Yes. Five hundred million that we are blocking for Ukraine. No, we are waiting for the Euro uh, Ukrainian delegation to come to Budapest to negotiate on that. We are open and ready to make a deal. Uh, Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Sorry. What? No, 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 no. We we have a very we have a very transparent and clear policy on that, which differ for the majority of the strategy here. Probably your strategy as well. You have a war strategy. We have a peace strategy. And we would like to do everything in order to have peace. Therefore, we keep open all the communication line to the Russians. Otherwise, there will be no chance for peace. This is a strategy. So we are proud of it. No, no. We are proud of it to do it. We are the only one who is speaking on behalf and in favor of the peace, which would be the interest of everybody in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is my video update from Prague, Czech Republic on this Friday midday, October the 27th. Let's talk about some news on this rainy day here in Prague. Good thing I have my Duran hoodie. <laughs> All right, let's... Uh, Let's talk about some, uh, some serious news, some very frightening news that is uh, developing. And uh, yesterday in my video update, I played, uh, I played a part of uh, Biden's response to reporters during a press conference in, uh, in the White House with uh, the Australian Prime Minister. Albanese and uh, Biden said in his response to a reporter's question about uh, the military buildup in uh, the Mediterranean and in the Middle East, the U.S. military buildup, Biden said that uh, he's he's warning Iran. He's sending a warning to Iran and to the Ayatollah. And Biden said this has nothing to do with Israel. Something like that. This has nothing to do with Israel or this is not about Israel in reference to the military buildup in the Middle East and the threats, more specifically in reference to the threats towards, uh, towards Iran. He said this has nothing to do with Israel. And so I thought that was an interesting statement from uh, Professor Biden, which, uh, which is actually uh, a bit of, uh, of truth from the U.S. president, the much of, much of the U.S. military buildup, most of the U.S. military buildup has nothing to do with Israel. They've been telling us that these uh, aircraft carriers and all of these U.S. military resources that have been moved into the Mediterranean, that this is about uh, a deterrence towards, uh, towards Hezbollah and, um, and Iran to not get involved in, in the conflict in Israel and in Gaza, that all of these, these aircraft carriers have been brought into the region to act as a deterrent force towards Hezbollah, specifically towards Hezbollah. And uh, now we get the revelation from the Biden White House, the, the statement from Biden himself, from the president himself that these threats towards Iran has nothing to do with Israel. I thought it was an interesting comment from the U.S. president. Because these, uh, these aircraft carriers that have been brought into the Mediterranean and all of this massive U.S. military force that is now, that is now descending onto the region, it really isn't about uh, Hamas or Hezbollah, for that matter. It's about uh, starting, starting a big war with Iran and, and with Syria. That's, that's how I'm looking at this. And uh, 
And just to give you an idea as to the military situation at the moment, we have we have uh, two uh, aircraft carrier uh, groups in the region. We have the the uh, Eisenhower Eisenhower carrier group, and we have the Ford carrier group. And just a couple of days ago, the Lincoln aircraft carrier and the Roosevelt uh, aircraft, aircraft carrier groups. They left their ports, which I believe are in San Diego, and they haven't announced the destination. We're not quite sure what the destination is, but I think we all understand where those aircraft carriers are heading towards. Maybe they're going somewhere else, but I imagine that uh, we're looking at two more aircraft carrier groups heading towards the, uh, the Middle East. So that is four, four aircraft carrier groups that could be present in this region. I believe the, uh, the Lincoln left its port in San Diego, either the Lincoln or the Roosevelt left uh, the port in San Diego on October 25th. So today is the 27th. And uh, just yesterday, we had the news that uh, the U.S. military that they, uh, they launched attacks against Iran. And according to the Pentagon, these attacks were done in self-defense. That is the statement from Lloyd Austin. He said that uh, these were self-defense, as a quote, self-defense strikes. They hit two facilities in eastern Syria used by Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and related groups. Austin stressed that they are not related to ongoing fighting between Israel and Palestinian militants. What did Biden say at the press conference with the Australian Prime Minister? This has nothing, nothing to do with Israel. So uh, that is the statement from the, the Pentagon, the Associated Press. Breaking the U.S. launched airstrikes against two Iranian-linked locations in Syria, the Pentagon said. The strikes followed drone and missile attacks against U.S. bases and personnel in the region that started last week. What the Associated Press fails to mention is that these U.S. bases in Syria and Iraq, to be quite honest, uh, they are illegally occupying uh, Syria. And as Trump famously said, they are there to steal Syria's oil. Isn't that what... Uh, what Trump said when he was uh, POTUS, they're in Syria to steal the oil, illegally occupying Syria. Uh, it, it really is upside down world, isn't it? Uh, the, the U.S. under the Obama-Biden White House, they, uh, they tried to regime change Assad. They unleashed the, the moderate, the moderate rebels, right? Uh, do my little air quote to the moderate rebels. They, they unleashed them in Syria to, uh, to try and overthrow Assad. They illegally occupy the north of Syria. They steal Syria's oil. The U.S. Uh, aircraft carriers are six, eight, ten thousand 10,000 miles away from, uh, from the United States. And uh, this is an act of self-defense, according to the Pentagon. Upside down world. They're, they're heading towards war. The Biden White House is heading towards war. The Washington Post, they reported that Biden weighs striking Iranian proxies after attacks on U.S. troops. The president must balance protecting U.S. forces under fire against the risk of getting drawn into a large conflict, officials say. Once again, the, the United States military, these aircraft carriers are located where exactly? Not, not in San Diego, not in the United States. These aircraft carriers made their way to the Middle East. And they're now acting in self-defense, according to the Washington Post. Biden, Biden has to balance, has to balance the, uh, the protection of U.S. forces located 6,000 miles away from, from their port with, uh, 
trying to not, to not widen out uh, the war in the Middle East, which is exactly what he is trying to do. He is trying to widen out the war in the Middle East. There's no other reason to move two and potentially four aircraft carriers into the area if not to widen out uh, the conflict and to provoke some sort of, uh, of strike on U.S. forces, some sort of attack on these aircraft carriers, some sort of false flag, who knows? But um, it's not going to take much to trigger an all-out conflict, that's for sure. There are reports that, uh, that drones, U.S. Navy's H-47 strike drones, have been spotted on uh, one of the aircraft carriers currently in the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, the thinking is that the Pentagon, they're going to, to use these drones to attack uh, Syria and Iran on, on an experimental basis. I don't know, that's possible. But uh, we, have, we have strike drones now located on these aircraft carriers. And there are reports that the U.S. may target Iranian crude. Washington is likely to tighten crude oil sanctions against Tehran over, over Iran's alleged support of the, Palestinian, of the Palestinian militant group Hamas. The head of the global commodity strategy at RBC Capital Markets, Helma Kroff, has said, talking to CNN on Wednesday, Kroff suggested that the West and the Biden administration would, at a minimum, consider curbing Iranian energy exports as a retaliatory measure. And this kind of falls in line with what Lindsey Graham said last week, which is that the U.S. should move its military assets to the region and they should strike at Iran's uh, oil facilities. That is what Lindsey Graham said last week. And now we're getting these, uh, these bankers, Wall Street bankers, RBC bankers, think tank, Think tank thinkers, they are think tank analysts. They are saying that the U.S. is going to, uh, to target Iranian crude because of Iran's links, alleged links to Hamas. No one talks about Qatar's <laughs> links to Hamas, which everyone knows about. Everyone knows that Qatar has very close links to Hamas, but no, no, one, no one dares mention that. It's, uh, it's Iran's links to uh, to Hamas. So that's where we are. That is where we are right now. Two aircraft carriers in the region. It looks like another two are heading towards the region. We have Biden openly admitting that uh, this military buildup pretty much has nothing to do with Israel, even though they've been telling us that this military buildup is about uh, deterring Hezbollah. Biden yesterday said, has nothing to do with uh, with Israel. Even the collective West media is now starting to say that this is really not about Israel, but this is about uh, this is about Iran or Iran militias in Syria attacking U.S. bases in the region, which are illegally illegally occupying parts of Syria. So it's this has all the dynamics, all the makeup of uh, of a big war. And that's where, that is where the Biden White House and the neocons, that's where they're positioning things to, to move towards, towards a big war. And the New York Times is saying that uh, Netanyahu is under an enormous amount of pressure by the Israeli military to get the, uh, the ground operation in Hamas underway. But Netanyahu has not signed off on uh, the, the, uh, the Israeli military ground operation. He hasn't given it the green light yet because the Biden White House keeps on telling him to delay it. Now, the first excuse was that the Biden White House, uh, actually Israel, said that they're not going to start the ground operation because of weather. Then they said that they're not going to start the ground operation until American hostages were released. And now they're just saying that, uh, that Netanyahu is just delaying. And it seems like the Israeli military is, uh, is getting angry with Netanyahu because the reports from the New York Times are that the Israeli military They've got hundreds of thousands of troops ready to go, and uh, they want to get the ground operation underway. The more they delay, the more uh, dangerous, according to the New York Times, it gets for the, uh, the Israeli military. And uh, the, more, 
the more public support, like international public support, that uh, that Israel loses, the more the ground operation is delayed. Is delayed. This is according to uh, the New York Times is reporting, but Netanyahu still does not give the green light. And so here's what I think is uh, is taking place. And we have and we have the 61 billion to Ukraine. Mike Johnson, the new House Speaker, he met with Biden uh, yesterday. And uh, he told Fox News that the House will try to split apart Israel aid and Ukraine aid. They're going to try to split it into two different packages and then bring it to the House floor. Uh, Mike Johnson, though, did signal that money is going to go to Ukraine. It may not be the $61 billion, but Johnson said that, uh, that House Republicans, they want to see some accountability with regards to the money that is going to the Alensky regime because he said that the Republicans, they don't want to print money to hand over to Alensky. What they're going to have to do is they're going to have to cut funds from other U.S. programs to hand over to the Alensky regime. Anyway, I bring that up uh, because here's what I think is, is taking place. And this is just a, just a thought, a thought experiment. I'm spitballing here. But I think the neocons, they're trying to create a perfect storm of, of chaos. That's what I think they're trying to do. So they're, uh, they're moving all the military assets to the Middle East because the neocons, they want to go after Syria. They want to get that regime change. And of course, they want to uh, go to war with Iran. They've been, wanting to go with their, to, they've been wanting to go to war with Iran for God knows how many decades. So now they have their opportunity. They've seen their opening and uh, they want to take it. So they want to get all the military assets everything that they need to to start this very very big war keep in mind the u.s is 33 trillion 34 trillion in, in debt probably a lot lot more than that and uh and the bankers the mic you know they they want a war for sure so the neocons they need time they still need some time to get everything in place so they want to create a type of perfect storm so they're telling netanyahu just delay as much as possible and, uh, and they want to get whatever money they can to the Alensky regime. They want Netanyahu to delay so that uh, when Israel begins its ground operation in, uh, in Gaza, then the, uh, the neocons can begin their operation towards Syria and, uh, and Iran. And they want to get tens of billions to the Alensky regime because... In neocon thinking, so let's walk over this way, this way, and then we'll go up on the bridge, Charles Bridge. Because in neocon uh, thinking, if they can get 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 billion to the Alensky regime, then they feel like they can give Alensky the money that he needs and the Ukraine military the support that it needs so that they can uh, continue to keep Russia occupied. They know that uh, they've lost this conflict. I think the neocons, even the neocons, I imagine, understand that they've lost Project Ukraine. Orban, yesterday in, uh, in a statement, he said that, uh, that Ukraine cannot and will not win. He said that uh, a lot of people realize this. Actually, he was like, most people understand this, even the European Union, but, but they can't say it out loud. They can't bring themselves to say it out loud for various political reasons. So I think everyone is starting to understand that Project Ukraine is lost. But if you can get the, if you can get the money to the Alensky regime, then the neocons probably feel like they can give the Alensky regime uh, enough gas so that it can uh, fight the Russians and keep them distracted so that Russia doesn't uh, intervene into the conflict with Iran. So I think they're trying to create this, the dynamics of a type of, of perfect storm and perfect distraction as well as they go after Iran and Syria. Get the ground operation started in, in Gaza, get the money to Ukraine so the Russians are occupied, and then go after Iran and, uh, and Syria. That's why you're seeing all these delays. That's why the Biden White House is pushing so hard for for funding to the Alensky regime. And, uh, and there you have it. And there you have it. And, uh, and as all of this is going on, we have, 
we have Biden's approval rating is is at the lowest point of the presidency. A survey was uh, conducted by Gallup and they found that 75 percent of registered Democrats approve of the of the job Biden is doing. This is down from 86 percent last month. I find it incredible that that 75 percent of Democrats actually approve of of Biden. <laughs> it's unbelievable, but <laughs> there you go. And uh, and Zelensky's polling numbers are also uh, down. Only 40 percent or only 42 percent of Ukrainians strongly approve of the president, while 40 percent somewhat approve. This is according to a poll from International Republic Institute, the IRI, and funded by USAID. So this is a USAID poll. 42% of Ukrainians strongly approve of Zelensky, while 40% some, somewhat approve. Those figures were at 58 and 33 in the same poll conducted in April. Maybe it's time for Aristovich to take over, but... You know, they have to they have to get the billions to the Alensky regime. His polling numbers are dropping and it may be it may be bad timing right now to switch out Alensky for Aristovich or or someone else. So the polling numbers for Biden are dropping. The polling numbers for uh, for Alensky are dropping. And the neocons, they uh, they desperately want to get all the pieces in place with Ukraine, with uh, the ground operation in Gaza, so that they can then launch their operation towards Israel and uh, towards, uh, towards Iran and, and Syria. That's what I think is happening here. So I talked about Orban. Orban is, uh, he's now, Orban is now coming out like, very publicly and saying that Project Ukraine is over. We need peace. We're heading towards all out conflict. He's like, look, I met with Putin. I met with Putin because I want peace. Someone has to talk to the Russians. And uh, Project Ukraine is over. Orban is now just openly admitting that this conflict is over. The EU has lost. Russia has won. And we need a ceasefire ASAP. So that's Orban. And uh, and Fico, Slovakia's Fico, he is echoing what Orban is uh, is saying. A lot of people on the bridge, a whole lot. So Fico is basically saying the same thing as Orban: no more money, no more military aid to Ukraine, and uh, we need a ceasefire. That is what Fitzo is saying. So, you know, little by little, step by step, we see that uh, Orban is gaining ground. His policies are gaining ground. He now has Fitzo there as well. And uh, I guess that's, that's a positive. If, if there's one positive that's happening, it's that Orban now with Fitzo, they, uh, I think they feel more, more solid in their position for uh, for pushing for negotiations and uh and the ceasefire and that's a good thing that's a positive like two three months ago orban wasn't this vocal he wasn't openly talking about the failure that is project ukraine now he's talking about it orban is now saying ukraine lost the Alinsky regime they lost Fitzo saying the same thing. They lost. That's pretty big news when you think about it. And they are losing. They are losing big. Avdivka is looking really, really bad for, for the Alensky regime. It's tough when you walk here because people are taking photos this way and you don't want to you don't want to disrupt them as they're taking their photos and their videos. So yeah, Avdivka is looking uh, really bad for the Ukraine military. Um, this is going to be a huge defeat for the Alensky regime. There are reports that the Alensky regime is now moving in 
elite elite forces into the area to try and hold on to it. But uh, from what I understand, the Russians, they're, uh, they're occupying uh, much of the hills and the high ground. And uh, Avdivka has turned into a type of mini, mini Bakhmut meat grinder for the Alensky regime. So, you know, they got to prevent, the neocons got to prevent Alensky from collapsing. They got to keep Alensky, the Ukraine military, they got to keep them afloat as, uh, as they move towards their, their big war in the Middle East. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get into some pre-clown world territory. And, uh, and we'll wrap this video up on this rainy day. So remember the, uh, the topic I talked about yesterday? Of course you remember. <laughs> it was only yesterday. I talked about Maria Zaharova and her statement following the EU's uh, overthrow Putin visa for Russian citizens. And this was an idea floated out by the Lithuanian foreign minister, Mr. Lanz Burgess. Gabrielis Lanz Burgess, he floated out an idea, a proposal for the EU to create a visa for Russian citizens. They could live in the European Union. They'll have a, a visa given to them by the European Union as long as they worked with the EU to overthrow the Putin regime. If they worked with the EU to uh, create some sort of color, color revolution, regime change, a coup d'etat in Russia, then they would be granted an EU visa. Beautiful, huh? Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that was the visa program from, uh, from the EU that they're considering. Well, uh, Maria Zaharova talked about this, and it looks like they're now acting on, uh, on dealing with this proposal from the Lithuanian foreign minister. The, the Russian uh, government, they're threatening criminal charges against uh, the Lithuanian foreign minister because he is, he is openly, public, publicly calling for a coup d'etat of the Russian government. And so they are thinking of pressing criminal charges against the Lithuanian FM, the foreign minister, which is, which makes sense. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're represent, if you're the foreign minister, you're the top diplomat of your country, and you're openly calling for for regime change of another government. You're not even openly calling for regime change of another government. You're actually talking about creating a program where you harbor uh, Russian citizens. You give them a visa and you plot with them to overthrow the government. I mean, that's pretty extreme. And so, yeah, Russia is saying, you know what? We're going to uh, press criminal charges against you. So I imagine the Lithuanian foreign minister, he should be, he should be scared <laughs> if I was him. If I was him, I would be worried if, he's, if, uh, if Russia actually does press criminal charges against him. That's a big deal. I imagine that the Lithuanian foreign minister is not going to sleep well at night. <laughs> that would be my, my take on it. But who knows? Maybe he feels like he's protected by by Bidenopolis, maybe he feels like he's, he's above Russian law, that they can't touch him. I don't know. I don't know. I think Russia has, has its ways. Who knows? Anyway, Russia's also, uh, they're also trying to extradite Hunka, the Canadian NAZI that's the entire Canadian Parliament applauded for, and Alensky applauded for, and Trudeau applauded for. The Russians, they now want to extradite him and send him to prison, <laughs> which is also a smart move. 
also a smart move from from the Russian government. Yeah, extradite the guy. Bring him to Russia, put him on trial. He's 98 years old, 99 years old, so uh, and I don't think Russia's going, I don't think uh, Canada is going to to extradite him. I don't think they're going to to honor Russia's request, but it's an interesting move from the Russian administration nonetheless. Anyway, let's now talk, since we're on the subject of Canada, let's, uh, let's discuss a document from Canadian General Wayne Ira, Ira. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. This uh, Canadian military official, one sec, it's a little noisy here. Give me one second to, to make my way out of here. I'm doing some nifty camera maneuvers this Friday. <laughs> some new camera techniques. Okay, so this Canadian general, he put out a document and uh, he basically said that Canada is at war with Russia and China. That's basically what he said. China and Russia are Canada's main enemies with both nations considering themselves to be at war with the West, according to a new document from the Canadian military. In language similar to that now being used by the Pentagon and NATO, the document outlines how the Canadian forces must change to prepare for a long-term conflict. We must remember that Russia and China do not differentiate between peace and war. Chief of Defense Staff General Wayne Eyre states in the introduction to the pan-domain force employment concept. So he puts out this document and basically this Canadian military official, he is saying that Canada is at war with China and Russia. And he puts the blame on China and Russia. That's the interesting part about it. He says that China and Russia do not differentiate between peace and war. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, these people are delusional. <sighs> Upside down world. Okay, let me... Okay, let me get to a real clown world here. This has all been pre-clown world territory. Let me get to a real clown world. And that has to do with Boris Johnson, Bojo. He's, uh, he's got a new job. The former UK prime minister, the man that prevented a ceasefire in Ukraine that flew to Kiev and told Alensky to tear up an agreement that the Alensky regime had signed off on in Turkey, an agreement which called for a ceasefire and called for an end to the conflict. You know, the whole, the whole siege of Kiev lie, <laughs> the siege of Kiev and all of that stuff. Well, the, uh, the siege of Kiev actually worked. And uh, by surrounding Kiev, Putin actually did bring Alensky to the negotiating table and they did work out a peace and Russia moved its forces out of Kiev and uh, they had a peace in place. It was signed by the Alensky regime and uh, Ukraine was not going to get into NATO and a month into the special military operation, all hostilities were going to come to an end. All good, right? Well, Boris Johnson flew to Kiev and he told Alensky, tear it all up. He said, tear up that agreement. Don't honor that agreement. Don't honor yet another agreement that the West has signed. And uh, we're going to give you all the money and all the weapons you need to take on the Russian military. And we're going to place these, these, uh, these awesome, amazing, super duper sanctions on Russia. And the Russian government's going to collapse. The Russian economy is going to collapse. And Zelensky, you're going to be king. 
you're going to be a hero. And uh, that is what Boris Johnson pretty much told Alensky. And Alensky tore up the documents and they chose war. They chose war. They chose conflict on Boris Johnson's urging. Anyway, why do I say all of this? Well, I say all of this because Boris Johnson has been given a very nice, cushy job for, uh, for the work that he did to uh, prevent peace from, from occurring in Ukraine and for convincing Alensky to tear up a peace agreement and opt for conflict with Russia. Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been hired by the Center for European Policy Analysis, CEPA, a Washington, D.C. think tank known to be bankrolled by the U.S. government, NATO, and Western military contractors. Johnson will be a member of CEPA's International Leadership Council, described as a high-level advisory group. The think tank announced this week, according to CEPA's head, Alina Polyakova, Johnson's commitment to Ukraine's victory makes him an invaluable addition to this distinguished group of thought leaders at what she described as a pivotal moment for the transatlantic alliance. Uh, Alina, Alina. <laughs> Looks like you have a good uh, job at SEPA as well. Anyway, that's, that's Boris Johnson's reward. Job well done, Boris. Job well done. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people killed and maimed and lives destroyed. And now we're on the brink of World War III. Here's a promotion. Understand what's going on. Free Gonzalo Lira. Free Julian Assange. How about... Uh, how about Poland and they're holding um, Pedro Gonzalez? Free these people. Anyway, that's the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Odyssey, Rumble, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and X, Twitter X, and go to the Duran shop. 20% off. Use the code VDuran20. Pick up. Pick up. A Duran hoodie. It is starting to rain hard now. You see? The hoodie works. <laughs> All right, everybody. Take care.